Welcome to the Star of Brian.
So when coming back in 1990, I came back in June, uh, July. Uh, had 20,000 rupees. That's pretty much all I had. Worked in the U.S. for three, four years. Uh, for some of you, may, might have gone there or had friends who had gone there. You know, you are a bachelor, three, four kids running around town. So you blow your money, you see everything. So came back pretty much with nothing. Uh, but more importantly, had significant confidence that I knew things to earn my way through. Uh, that when you jump into something, you pretty much got nothing to lose. So, if you have already reached a significant position, then you got a lot of things to lose. But if you know that all that you got to lose is 20,000 rupees, then you can afford to take a whole lot of risks. Uh, and for uh, entrepreneurship, those things are very critical. Uh, you need to be able to take risks. And you need to have confidence that, that you can get back on if something should fail. So, I mean, what is it that when you were doing, let's say, you were working in the US, right? so what made you decide, okay, entrepreneurship is what I want to do? Uh, in the sense, you took a plunge, you said, I'm going to start a software company in India. What made you decide, okay, software, what made you decide training? Um, unlike what it is today, um, in uh, early 1991, uh, especially in technology, uh, obviously we didn't have the way. Uh, the internet was unheard of. So the gap between what was happening in the US or probably even most of Europe and India was very significant. The gulf was huge. Um, I had a chance to work in a company called Skybase working in the US. came back to India. India at that time was doing a lot of cobalt. Uh, Unify was just about being adopted in the country as an advanced database. And I had only seen in the US that Unify was dying. And the uh, at that time the world was all uh, Oracle, Informix, Ingress and Sybase was somewhere, you know, catching up but catching up faster. You sort of saw what was there, and I knew that three years, four years from now, that's sort of where India was going. Uh, more importantly, I was already in touch with a number of people, be it from or, or HCL, uh, who are starting to place people abroad for software services work. Um, just to uh, just so that you understand, uh, in 1991, HCL had probably between 60 to 70 people working in all of the United States. That was the, really the size of their software business at that time. But just going across meeting people from Wipro, going meeting people from TCS, one understood that big money was if they had resources in some of the advanced database, that's really where the money was for most of these big companies and not in providing people with COBOL or Unified Knowledge. So when I sort of came back to India and uh, saw what some of these companies were doing, and at that time it was all Aptek and NIIT. Uh, they were talking about some word processing, spreadsheet, uh, database, and all of that meant was uh, word perfect and I'm not even sure whether it was Excel or, you know, uh, one, two, three, was <coughs> you had D-Base. So that was sort of what was being taught over you know, two years and three years. And one realized that what the big companies required were talents of a completely different order. So it was not very difficult to sort of see where things were going and where the demand was going to come. So how did you set up the company? I mean, coming from uh, the US, you obviously knew what had to be done. But how did you set it up here? I mean, you and your brothers decided to set it up. What was the, uh, the sense? How did you initially fund it? How did you grow the team? 
Um, you know, as I said, you know, I, I just came back with 20,000 bucks. Uh, I don't even think my brothers had even half of that with them. Um, so we went about understanding what it took to set up a place where somebody could come and get trained. Um, so a lot of things were just happenstance, you know. If I were a student, what would I look for? It was really what drove us to work, how we set things up. Um, and obviously 20,000 rupees even in those days can, pay, can carry only that far. Uh, so I remember that, you know, just a day before we actually opened it up, uh, we realized we were running short and most of the walls were painted by me, my brothers, my sister and my wife. So we just took up the brush paint and just painted the walls. Because we didn't have to pay anybody 4 rupees per square feet to them. Um, you know, as I said, if you are willing to take the risk and you know you got the skill set to back it up if something goes wrong, you just do it. As far as you are very clear that you know you are going to get this done and you know that this is going to be important. So how did you start by growing your game? What, what was the initial steps? Because you obviously had a goal of making a large training company here. So how did the process work from scratch to getting to where you were? Um, uh, the advantage compared to somebody who is fresh out of college to uh, somebody who had probably worked for 3-4 years uh, sort of makes that difference. Um, when I went representing HCL, I, I went as somebody on HCL's payroll and you know, went there to work at Cybase. Um, I was, HCL in those days used to do a lot of hardware exports for people, you know, sort of go back to those days. And I was the first person who went to the US to represent HCL in software. Um, so I used to, work with the company very closely, you know, where I was working. I used to raise the invoice for my own work. I used to collect the money for my own work, follow up for payments with the company, deposit the money, do my expenses, put in my vouchers, take, draw the money. I was literally running the account. Uh, so when the first set of people came, I was sort of the guy who took charge of putting them in an apartment, and ensuring that they settle down, getting them the orientation to work in the US, introducing them to customers. So in some sense, it sort of built up a background for myself in terms of managing people, customers, invoicing, collections, expenses, people, salaries. So I'd seen quite a bit of that before I actually came back. So when I set the business, do I need, what does it cost? sort of put the numbers um, so uh, so it wasn't that difficult and from growing from I think scratch to uh, a global company because I remember reading that you had also acquired a company in the US for a substantial amount how did that happen because I think that happened over a period of five or eight years so how, will, how did the transition happen from being a small startup company to being a large global player? I think in terms of key inflection points, if you will, in the journey was, uh, I think end of year one, when we broke even in terms of cash, uh, because the first few months we ran deficits, huge deficits and, you know, for somebody who comes from a fairly simple background, two lakhs and three lakhs could be huge deficits. Uh, but year one we closed breaking even. Um, 1995 was another inflection point when we actually went out and listed the company. Um, we did an IPO in 1995. So that was another inflection point. Um, I still remember we sold 60% of the company to raise two and a half crores. Uh, and we did an issue at par. Uh, after four years. So a lot of people used to ask as to how would you, why would you want to do four years of hard work, build something of significance and then give it away at par. Um, but I think that money sort of helped us 
to fast forward to 1997 uh, when we actually set up our first company in the US to look at software services. Uh, 1999 fast forward was another inflection point when we got into setting up the software services business under the name of SSI Technologies. Uh, network helped, so we got the best and the brightest people in town to head up each of the verticals. Um, and 1999, made, uh, we acquired a company uh, which was uh, run by another IIT alumni called Indigo. Um, and then it took us six months to strategize and understand where and how to move this company. Uh, in six months, we understood where the strength was. Uh, we established relationships and uh, we signed a joint venture with the NASDAQ stock market. So that was another inflection point in 2000. Uh, in 2000, we listed on the London Stock Exchange. So we raised about 100 million at that time. Um, and then we went to the US to acquire a couple of businesses. Um, one was doing a lot of software services where we saw potential to move those businesses offshore. The uh, other one was doing a lot of work for the U.S. government uh, in terms of food stamps and loyalty programs for their citizens. Um, at each point of time, we had a significant business that was providing cash flows. Uh, so in 1997, when I stepped out to go to the U.S. to set up a business for six months in the U.S., and in India, we had built a very strong team to run our education business. Um, in 1997, we were already in 200 locations in India. So there was a significant cash flow that was established by the time I left. Uh, and it was in very same hands. I had a great guy from ex Vipro, who was my chief operating officer, uh, running the entire business. So I could go spend six months established the business in the US, set up the office, get people, create the first set of revenues, ensure it broke even, and then came back. Uh, by the time we listed on the London Exchange, established the joint venture, which obviously required significant amount of work. Um, SSI was in over 800 locations in India. So, at every point in time, Establish significant cash flows, significant business as a backstop, and then you go out and take risks. Uh, so every time it was an incremental step. So it never went from small to very large. Uh, it took close to 12, 15 years. So what made you hire off the uh, education arm of SSA? Because you hired the top, then you hired off the software, then got to real estate. So what made you go through this? Uh, for people, 2000. Uh, 2000 was the first wave as far as the technology business was concerned. It went through a big high and then it dropped as though there was no bottom. So that was the tech bubble that one saw happening in 2000 March and by 2000 September, October it was very deep. Uh, by the time we hit 9-11, in 2001, uh, that was pretty much the last straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, for people who follow the stock market, the Nifty index, which is today about 6,200, hit 970 in 2001. It completely fell. Uh, a lot of stock lost everything. Uh, stock like Infosys, compared to the March 2000 high, lost 90% of value. Forget other companies. So, a lot of big companies lost significantly in the bubble that burst. Obviously, it meant when the lag between services to education at that time was about six, six and a half months. Which means if there is a slowdown in the services business, which means they start going slow on hiring. Um, in about four, five months, you will find that the placement starts lagging. And then it becomes a drag which essentially means that people don't think it's a great prospect to be educated. So, by 2002, we realized that education was going through a slow. 
we didn't think the software services was business was again going to jump back real quick, uh, which means big companies stopped recruiting. Uh, some of them started getting people off their roles. They were terminating people. Engagements from a customer, a lot of engagements were being put on hold uh, or being terminated. Um, so at that time, uh, so just you folks within the room, we established contact with both NIIT and Aptec. So we announced Aptec. We were talking to both of them. So on one side, we were talking to Pawar and Tadani of NIIT, and we used to meet in neutral locations where both of us would fly. We would fly to Bangalore, they would fly from Delhi. We meet in Bangalore. Parallelly, we were meeting Atul of Aptec. And our proposal was fairly simple. That that there was no place for three companies in India, given the slowdown that was happening. All three of us were getting hurt. Uh, we felt there was place for maybe two, ideally one company. There was no place for three. So our proposal to both companies was that we are willing to acquire you. You've required both. Uh, we can pay cash, we can pay by stock. And if they're not willing to sell, we were more than happy to sell for stock or for cash. Because our view was that the business environment was such, there was no place for three. It doesn't matter who ran those businesses, but there was no place for three. Um, for whatever reason, with an IIT, we went through a lot of diligence on both sides, but we just could not complete it. Uh, because I don't think the people who sat with us for the meeting owned a substantial part of the company. Whereas from our side, we won't close to 70%. So we could decide to do whatever and ensure that it got passed, but they were not so sure. So it dragged for a year, nothing happened. Uh, with Atul, it was a lot faster. Uh, and he was very clear that he was selling. In the sense that he understood it was slowing down. Uh, it was very clear that he had, you know, his daughters were studying in the US and his education business was India, his services business was in the US and he couldn't keep shutting. So we did an agreement with uh, Aptec to buy them out, uh, but more because that was demanded by the environment and the slowdown that was happening. So it was not as though it was more, it was not so much strategic, but by a demand of the environment. Uh, once we decided to acquire Aptec, we also decided to separate the education and the services business. So internally, we actually sold SSI education to Aptec after we acquired Aptec. So the first step, we acquired Aptec, made an open offer, took control, and then on this side, we sold SSI education, merged it with Aptec. So separated the education business into Aptec and the services business stayed with SSI. After which, you hired off the Aptec itself to a third investor, if Subsequently, we sold. Um, and I think a lot of that was triggered by uh, my own reasons to sort of step away from operating businesses. Uh, my kids were growing up. While all of this was happening, I got married, got kids. Um, so they were growing up and here I was traveling quite a bit. I mean at some point, I was almost doing 22 days of travel in a month. Uh, and often I would find myself waking up in a hotel, maybe in New York or you know, Amsterdam, and wondering where I was at 3, 4 in the morning. So I sort of decided that I needed to cut back, spend more time with kids all growing up. Um, so at some point we decided that we will quite, quite clinically get out of operating businesses in a fashion. Uh, so the first step was we sold Antec uh, to an investor group driven by Rakesh out of pocket. He continues to run it. Um, the services business we merged into a company uh, called Scandent in Bangalore. Um, and uh, SSI Limited when it was finally sold in 2007 December, that's when we sold it. Uh, but in 2005, we had already sold our services business under Aptec. We had demerged our 
services business and merged it into Scandit. And in 2006, early SSI Limited was actually a shell company with no businesses or sold. Um, so we brought in some of the properties that we had bought into SSI, made an open offer, acquired 75% of the company. Um, and in 2007, December, we sold SSI Limited, which at that time was actually a property development business. Nothing to do with education, nothing to do with services. It was actually a property development business which we finally sold in 2007 December. And uh, I mean, after that you decided to take a step back and then now you're back on board with AGS with Kalpati Investments. What got you to get back to the Um I think this journey is a lot different from the earlier one. The earlier one was very frenetic, um, fast-paced, very involved. Um, post-2007, uh, Kapati Investments was established to look at private equity investments, very early stage, seed investment uh, in various companies in sectors that we had identified. Uh, AGS Entertainment was pretty much a happenstance. Uh, I think somewhere in 2008, we had sort of really, I wouldn't say we took a step back, we took hundreds of step back. Uh, so literally cooling our feet, pretty much doing nothing. Um, and in 2008, as all of you are aware, the, the technology went through a second hump. And uh, a Sunrise business like uh, property development, all of that really took a no step. So 2008, January, the stock market again tumbled deep. Uh, we had the Merrill Lynch's of the world failing. We had the Lehman Brothers of the world failing. Uh, and the market went down. We sort of sensed it when we sold out in 2007, uh, December. Um, so I remember 2008, last quarter, somebody came by the office and said, you know, we're doing this movie, can you finance it? So before we actually produced a movie, we, we had financed a couple of movies without putting a name there, just to understand how this thing worked. Not so much as a business, but more for fun. Um, two weeks ago, we put for our 20th movie. In 2008, fast forward five years, we never thought that this was going to be something we'll be significantly involved in. Uh, but there it is. I think still the enjoyment quotient is 50%. Uh, because if it goes below that, then you know we wouldn't be there. Uh, so it's a lot of fun, but uh, it, it's got its own returns. So we're also making some money out of it. Otherwise, you know, we just wouldn't do it for charity. Um, we also have an exhibition business uh, where we have screens under the name of AGS Cinemas. Uh, we are setting up some more. I think two more properties are being developed. Uh, which adds another 10 screens to what we have. Uh, and that sort of... I have a niece who went and studied in the US. She's from an university. She went abroad, did her MS in sunny Buffalo, came back, computer science, and wanted to do a whole lot of things in software. And they said, you know what, we just bought a property, would have to develop it as a theater. She was, she slogged and you know she had to do something. So she slogged, built it up, she liked what she was doing. So we went out and bought something on OMR. Uh, now she is full fledged. So it was sort of got into just to ensure my niece had something to do. And now I think she's got quite a bit of things to do. So it's developing into a nice property. It's, it's developing into a good business. Uh, we see a lot of potential uh, in the exhibition business. Uh, but Predominantly, the idea of stepping back is, is still true because some of the things which I missed was being able to spend time with kids and family, which I now am able to do. Um, and my benchmark is, if for a moment, if I'm not able to go home in the evening at 4.30 for a cup of coffee, then I know something is going wrong with my planning, uh, which continues to happen. So before I came, I went home, had a cup of coffee, spent some time with my crossword, and then I came. Um, 
I do a lot of running. And that took a hit, you know, at some point in time, which I could not do. Uh, now I do a whole lot of marathons. Uh, I just completed one in Berlin in September. Uh, 3rd, 23rd, there is one in Tokyo that I'm going to. Uh, so I enjoy doing my runs. Uh, so I ensure that does not get impacted. Um, I travel quite a bit to temples, at least twice a month. Um, so I ensure that doesn't get impacted. Uh, when I say not get impacted, just this morning we decided that we will go to a few of our past temples in Kerala. Come next week Friday, or this week Friday. So all it took was part of my secretary saying, you know, clean up Friday, Saturday and not it up. And so those were the things I missed. Uh, so well, you know, we are into a number of activities in a sense, it's from a step back. Uh, so every company that we have invested in, uh, we are never in the boat. We never put anybody inside the company to double check, triple check. We don't do it. Uh, wherever we have made investments, I'm very clear that if required, we will talk to them to understand where they are heading. They don't need to report. Uh, if required, somebody from my office will call and ask, uh, which does not happen at anything more frequent than once a quarter. Uh, so all of our investments are from a step back. I never get calls from any of my investing companies, uh, which is part of the requirement. And, you know, they cannot keep calling me. Uh, but we do a lot of diligence before we put money. Uh, so while we are doing a whole lot of things, uh, it's not coming the way of what I had set out as goals when we started stepping back from a lot of these businesses. Uh, so while we are doing something in entertainment, investing, the primary factors that I wanted to achieve sort of still stays. I had actually read somewhere that one of your strategies was uh, at that point when you started building SSI was to scale up quickly and with shock value. Uh, would you be able to elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, it sort of comes up when you are young. You know, when you are you know, 25, 27, a lot of hot blood. Especially when you have nothing much to lose, you know, you can do a lot of things, very bold. Uh, because in those days, I still remember, you know, when we started out, Aptek and NIT were already established players. It's not that they were startups, they were already established players. Not many people thought there was a business opportunity in, in taking them head on, uh, which we did. Uh, not so much of... Uh, shock value, but more in terms of uh, that point, more in terms of fun to see how they would react. So we would keep hitting them almost once in a month or once in two months. But it was all fair and square, uh, taking them head on very clean and uh, sort of literally challenging them to stand up and be counted. And a lot of targets we used to internally set for ourselves was uh, saying that within five years from where we started was to see how we could catch up. So uh, in initially we had set up a target saying five years. Obviously when we moved in five years, they moved ahead by another three years. But they were moving slower than we were. So we were catching up with them faster than they were moving ahead from that point. Uh, so, when we actually acquired Aptec uh, as SSI, we had 1,500 locations in India and Aptec had, across all brands that they had, uh, 1,400 centers. So, we thought of going ahead of them, uh, we put them together and uh, together we had 3,000 locations including China where we expanded after we acquired into about 120 locations in China. Uh, so shock value came from a lot of young blood challenging them to catch up, but all parents were. 
Now, I mean, anybody who has been in business would have definitely made some mistakes along the journey. What would you say the biggest ones you were? You know, how did you solve them? Solve them? Um, mistakes would be innumerable. I'm not going to be able to count and tell you how many, but be assured they were innumerable mistakes. Um, but I think the and how quickly you can move on and make course correction is what defines a successful business. Um, I think the biggest that happened, and I think it sort of caught the entire industry, was we were expanding at a breakneck speed in 2000. When the slow bubble burst, everybody was going uh, with not a view as to what one would do if there is a slowdown. Was never a view. So nobody thought ahead in terms of saying if there should be a slowdown, what is plan B? There was no plan B. Now just moving ahead, saying, okay, we have now 15 locations in West Bengal. How do we now go to Assam? How do we go to Meghalaya? And how do you go to Ethiopia? So there is no plan B. It was all, you know, how do I expand? How do I, you know, how do I establish London? There was no plan B. So when the bubble burst, we realized that that was our biggest mistake, that we never put a plan B. It was all, you know, one way. Um, and the course correction was not easy. It was very difficult. Because you had invested so much in growth for you to pull back was not easy. Uh, but the concept of I think it caught a lot of players got caught on the wrong foot. Um, and so from there on there was always a plan B. In everything and anything we did, there was a plan B. Which essentially means that even when we do investing, there is always a plan B. When we go into any, there is always a plan B. So what happens if something slows down tomorrow so dramatically? Uh, which means for some of the movies, even after we do the puja, uh, one of the recent movies, you know, without giving a name, but one month before we put puja, we had already sold and we made about, you know, for people who know some of account, so we made an IRR of about 30%, sold the movie one month before we put puja. Why? Because that could be a slowdown. So my risks are capped, I made my money, and we will execute the project. But, uh, so there is now always a plan B. So that was the biggest mistake. Now, uh, these days a lot of entrepreneurs are bootstrapping, you know, young people who are What would be your advice to them in terms of scaling up in terms of company with very limited funds? Um, I think the biggest challenge is to leave the comfort of your job in with a very clear vision, you know, how much you achieve, uh, how much of the money you have not raised, but just the fact of making the decisions in business, uh, take it from me, to a 50% already there. By just taking the decision to come out of your comfort zone saying, I am going to go here, this is what, this is my plan, this is where I am going and this is the team I am going to work with to make it happen. I have checked my job, I am here, I am looking forward. That's working on creates absolute value. That's another 25%. The other 25% is about money, is about fundraise, is about you know which investor, which HNI, how much would he put, how do I do the series A, how do I do series B, how do I... All of that is a balanced 25%. Uh, as far as you know that you are creating value in whatever that you are doing, 
is most critical. Uh, and we just give examples. Uh, at the time when the bubble burst, people thought the big thing was eyeballs. Uh, that didn't take many people many places. Uh, it was sort of a fad up in the air, you know, it looked good. And when the chips were down, you know, some of them today would look back at saying that how the heck did the world invest in businesses like this? But, you know, people invested. I mean, yeah, AOL had a market cap to actually buy out Time One. I mean, valuation is so far ahead of themselves. Uh, because people didn't look at, were they creating absolute value? People thought eyeballs was value, but eyeballs is never value. For whom is that value? So, as far as you know that you are doing something that creates absolute value, be it a product, be it an app, be it a service, you know, it doesn't matter. But as far as it creates absolute value and you have a plain plan to build this to scale. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, there is somebody that I know and uh, he runs along with me for quite a few years. So he was working in a nice job, chucked his job, not that he has built it big, but I know he's sort of heading in the right direction. So his view was that today a lot of people as they start owning apartments, houses, you know, whatever, uh, they have a lot of tasks for which they are willing to pay but not able to get a service. It could be a plumber who needs to come home to fix a faucet that's leaking overnight but he just don't know where to go. You, you know that you need it. And if somebody should say it will cost you 500 bucks, a lot of people are willing to pay. They just don't know who to approach, how to get this done. Or somebody who's got to set up the electrical line so that I can put an extra TV here, I'm willing to pay. Obviously, I don't know how to do it myself. I'm not going to break the wall. I don't know how to set up a jumper. I don't know. I'm willing to pay. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can get a cook. I'm trying to get a driver. I'm willing to pay. Uh, so this guy set up a business just to provide this to people. Uh, today is doing 12 crores, he makes 2 crores of profit uh, right here in Chennai. Started 5 years ago, built it to scale. Uh, he's going to get his next round of investment. He's looking at setting up similar businesses in other parts of India and wants to take it national. Uh, because he was very clear that he was adding value. Here is a pain point. And now all you got to do is just call a single number, you say it, it happens. People are willing to pay because it solves a pain point. So as far as you are very clear that you are establishing something that creates absolute value, uh, this will all happen. You just have to be focused and have faith and conviction. It will all happen. Uh, it might seem happenstance, you know. I know so many people on this day, if, if I had not met this guy, my life would have changed. And that made all the difference. Maybe it's true. And I've had so many people who had told me that, you know, out in Russia, I met this ambassador who gave me the opportunity for the first business, otherwise I would have folded up. Not necessarily true. Because if you have the conviction and drive, if you hadn't met that guy, one week later you would have met another guy and you would have told a different story saying, if I had not met this guy in Mylapur, I would have folded up. But you would have never folded up. And two weeks later you would have met this guy in Bombay who would have made the difference to you in your life. Because you are convinced, you are focused and you are by the door waiting for me to knock. As far as you are able to do that, you will hear the knock, you will open the door, you will make it. Uh, so the rest will all happen. Whether it happens in one year, one and a half years, it will all happen. Uh, so 50% is to get out of comfort zone. 25% having conviction that you are creating absolute value. The rest of 25% the balance of what makes the success. Thanks, and I think that's it from me. I'm going to open the floor for questions and from the audience. Let's pass the back up to that. 
Okay. Suppose we are coming to you for funding. What are things? Three things you have to see. Um, the, uh, so here is how we go about and it's very simple. Uh, we do very early stage investing, which means we don't invest in subsequent rounds. Uh, what does it mean? That if you have already got an investment, for instance, I'm just giving an example, let's say from Chennai Angels or the Mumbai Angels or you know, or an HNI. And then you are coming to us for the next round. We don't do that investment. Uh, ideally, we are we are the first investor in the company. Obviously, after the promoters, or ideally along with the promoters. Uh, the second one that we look for is uh, our exits are three to four years. From the time we invest, four years later we start looking for exits. Uh, so we look for businesses where we believe four years from now that particular business will hit a high. So we also want to ensure in some form that we time our uh, Third, we don't try to understand sectors in which a company is working. We have already identified where we have done some deep dive homework. We know those sectors will look good four years, five years from now. And then we look for companies in that sector. So if you're not in the sector that we are looking at, our decision is fast, furious, immediate. Not interested. Not because the team is not good, not because the business is not good, not because the sector is not good. It's just that that's not done our homework. And hence we don't look at companies in those sectors. So we look at four or five sectors and we do a lot of investments in those sectors. So, four year to exit, we should be the first investor. Uh, and then we look at the company, we look at the promoter. Uh, for us, the, uh, the promoter, the drive, the fire in the belly, our belief in terms of how far this promoter will go to make things happen is far more critical than the state of your current business. Do any risk of sectors? Uh, uh, technology is one. Uh, they are actually location agnostic in some sense. The last one we did was in San Francisco, where we had invested. This was about a year and a half ago. Uh, this is a uh, 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 database. It's a product company. It's a database that sits in Flash uh, for uh, web scale data. So we are talking terabyte plus data processing. Uh, two months ago, Gartner put out a report saying that these guys are 10 times faster than the fastest available currently in the world. Uh, and one of them being MongoDB, you know, which, which was in the press for all the wrong reasons. Um, having said that, general investments, you know, apart from sector, in terms of geography, uh, I look for investments that I can make which are uh, in India, ideally Tamil Nadu, preferably Chennai. And if I can have my way 15 minutes from wherever. Uh, including this company in San Francisco where I can be, uh, his uh, parents live in Ananagar. Uh, this guy studied with me at school. He studied with me at IIT too. So I know him for a long time. So in terms of character and integrity, I'm absolutely sure. Right sector. And uh, he keeps coming to Ananagar. His parents are still here. So the only reason is it just makes it easy. You know, I can very easily go and invest in a company in Ludhiana. Uh, it will take me six hours to reach Ludhiana. Hopping two different flights. Uh, and those six hours is no value add to the company, no value add to me. So if it is close to where I live, it that's that much easy to do meetings or to go face to face and chat, it's that much easier. Uh, so sector wise, uh, technology is one. 
uh, we are investing in some parts of education, not all of it, some parts of education. Uh, we are investing quite a bit in agriculture. Uh, not so much in trading, but actually growing things on the ground. Uh, we are investing in seeds. Uh, we are investing in dairy. We are investing in infrastructure, but from an execution perspective. Uh, we think uh, three, four years from now, uh, things would have turned around. Infrastructure is going to become big in India. So we are taking some calls. So we are making investments in that sector. Uh, valuations are rock bottom. So it's a great time to be there with conviction to start picking up stuff. Uh, we uh, have been looking at, again, some facets of entertainment. Uh, we uh, also understand, again, some parts of microfinance very well. Uh, so those are sort of broadly sectors. Uh, we are looking at adding a couple of more. We are still doing our homework. It takes time for us to do the homework because my team size is two, so it goes at that pace. But these are sectors where we are very clear, we move very quickly, we see an opportunity. So you say technology is a technology or is it technology? Uh, information technology. Uh, what is the quantum of investments that you are making to make? I think in terms of absolute numbers, the smallest investment we have made is uh, I think 60 lakhs. Uh, the largest investment we have made is uh, 35 crores. So, so it can go literally end to end. It depends on where we see an opportunity and you know, how we are able to size it. This is something to leverage on your experience when you started up. I remember startup and I'm having huge difficulty in acquiring and retaining talent. So how I started, I'm kind of fighting against the likes of the accessory courses where I'm able to get the senior most people, they are pretty mature enough to come and work with me. I'm able to get freshers, that's easy as well. But I want to get these four, five years, you know, mid-level programmers and that's pretty difficult. And uh, you know that's the challenge. Not only me, a few other people like me as well. Like uh, it's hard to retain them. We spend a lot in getting them, train them, but then they obviously leave. And it's not really sustainable. We're having a lot of problems. Um, I don't think you're seeing it in the right perspective. Uh, if you sort of flip around and and assuming that. You are a guy who's got five, six years of experience, you know, is sort of becoming a project lead type of guy. You know, you just got promoted from a system analyst to a project lead. And, uh, and here is a startup guy who has called me for an interview. And he expects me to stay with him for life. Why would you stay with him for life? You know, looking at it from the other side, that's what you would want as a owner of the startup. But you know, sitting on the other side of the table, as this guy with five years plus experience, you know, project lead, I am possibly just married or going to get married. I'm going to raise a family, and this guy is a startup. I don't know where this guy is heading. Uh, if he's not able to organize this affair as well, he might pull the plug next year. I don't know, uh, but I got bills to pay. I've got a family to look after and this they expect me to stay for life. As far as you get that, as far as you are able to give answers from that viewpoint, I think we will fix it. So, when I set up the business, obviously we pulled people from, we looked at pulling people from AppTech and I, you know, sort of look up. But another way to look at it is, Rather than aspiring to those guys, you need to look at people who are sort of below you. 
pull people from there, but add enormous value to them. Which means that every time they have a 10 minute chat with you, they need to go back saying, wow, I learned something today. Sometimes that might help you to retain people. Because what is in it for me? One, if I had gotten into a big company and lost, I'm one of the 68,242 people who are there in this company. Whereas here, I'm one of the 60 people in the company. So I, some people, they like it. Two, what is my incentive? I'm risking so much. So what do I get? So if this guy makes it big, am I also going to make it big? So some type of a stock option, plan, ownership helps. Uh, but if he or she is a person who is looking for safety because I'm already married, I just have a kid who is one year old, chances are you're going to find it difficult A to recruit him, B even if you recruit to retain him. Because as a startup your business will go through ups and downs. I mean it's not going to go like that. It's going to go through ups and downs. The first down, these are the set of people who will jettison. Because they're looking for safety. I mean, if I were them, I would have done the same thing. You know, I'm looking for safety and I will jump ship. And I've seen a lot of these people, people who are very close, dear friends of mine, who have jumped ship during the 2000 bubble burst. I mean, I know of a guy who used to work with me at HCL, got into a big position at Oracle, left the job um, somewhere in the beginning of 1999, because he got a whole bunch of stock options in a company in San Francisco, hot startup. I mean, 1999, everything was hot in technology. Hot startup, stock options. He left a great job at Oracle, joined the startup, and he thought, you know, he's, you know, like I said, nobody had a plan B. So he thought, you know, this company is going to do an IPO and he's going to make tons of money. At that time, he already had one kid. He had already bought a house which means he was paying mortgage on the house, he was paying something for the car, he was paying something for insurance. I mean, he had a number of fixed bills to pay. And here he was jumping ship from an oracle, you know, joined this hot startup because he got stock options, he got a sign-on bonus, they said they will sponsor his master's study at University of you know, California at Berkeley, which was just you know, across the Bay Bridge. And in 2000, when this whole thing burst, he went so quickly running back to an oracle that 13 years later, he's still an oracle, working. Uh, never looked for a startup after that ever in his life. So, you know, people like that, where you know that they are married, probably having a kid, they're not your stayers. So, why? Because if, if I'm that guy, why would I want to join this kid doing a startup? He might do it, maybe he has a very temporary reason to do it, but you know, the first down, he's going to leave it. The second one that you might want to look for are people whom you know, even before you started the business. So they're not with you for business reasons, but they know you. Uh, because the startup goes to a lot of, the beta is very high. You have a lot of very exciting times, you have a lot of down days. So you got to be able to take this up and down and you need a team who will take it along with you as a startup. You don't have that cushion to provide that level steady playing field for your employees as it. So they, you, got, you got to have a senior team that will go up and down along with you. So sometimes if you know he's somebody who has been with you from school days, chances are high he will stay with you because you got a lot more team going in that relationship than just business salary and you know what's today, what's tomorrow. You've got a lot more things going there. So that relationship can stretch and give you that comfort when things are down. And he, is, he or she is somebody who will you know, take the high along with you. Uh, example, when I started the business, uh, three of my top people, two of my top people, both were brothers. So that relationship stretches quite a bit. Um, Two more guys whom I brought on board, who also became executive members of my board. Uh, one of them I know that I knew their family when they were kids playing cricket. Know them I know, I know their father, mother. They were my best uncle and aunt. 
So he was almost like my own brother. So I brought him on board. Another person who had worked with me for donkey's years. 